Hello and welcome to this exciting episode of Mind the Gap, making education work across the globe with me, Tom Sherrington and Emma Turner. Hello, Emma. Hello, Tom. I wonder if you're as excited as I am about tonight. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's great. This is the great privilege of our, our show that we get to uh, meet our educational heroes and Jim. Welcome, Jim Knight. It's great to have you. I'm honoured to be here. Yeah, so you're, you're, you're someone who um, sort of crept up on, on me in, in my professional life, mainly through my, my great friend Oliver Caviglioli, who talks about you all the time. <laughs> and uh, he basically introduced me to, to your work. And now, no, my, my shelves, you, I have more books by Jim Knight on my shelf than by anybody else. So there you go, that, that's it, if that means anything. So, you know, how, how, well, I asked this to, of Dylan William, actually, the same sort of question, but how do you feel about having this sort of status as a kind of grandeer, kind of a father figure in the world of education because of the kind of status that you have? Do you, do you feel that? A hundred percent. No, I don't really feel uh, anything. In fact, it all sounds a little foreign to put it that way. I, um, uh, no, I'm very conscious of my limitations uh, in in areas where I'd like to grow, and uh, uh, and I'm grateful for the in, in large part the people who shape my thinking. I know everything I've done has really been a product of other people I've worked with. So I, I don't, I don't. I <laughs> it might be fun to feel. I guess there are times, maybe at a conference, where I kind of feel like people are, oh, you're Jim Knight, but it. Um, no, I don't. And also, my wife is quick to you know, humbled me. She's, she, she, she says things like, uh, they only laugh at you because, you know, they, they think they have to, you're not really that funny. So she, keep, she keeps it from actually going anywhere. So it's, it's obviously, it, so it's important to be grounded. I know it's probably, you know, embarrassing you to start with, but it's, it, it's, I think it's worth saying, you know, I, I think it's in our world of teachers, teachers are generally humble people, I find. And I think it's, 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 it's pretty amazing to have created this body of work, which has, has been so influential. And I think it's worth celebrating now. And one of the one of the things we like to do is is, is celebrate things which are, are current. And this is this has just come out, instructional coaching, seven factors for success, which is the, the UK edition of the, the same book, um essentially, the right. US. And it's just uh, yeah. <laughs> we don't have a so now this is I and I had I you invited me to write the forward for this, so I had a sort of chance to read it. And it's just um it's just a fantastic encapsulation of this wonderful thing, instructional coaching. So, you know, what, what's the kind of the, the sort of difference around this? So, but the previous book, I think the one you're most well known for is the impact cycle and like right. Jim Knight's impact cycle. So what, what's the difference for people who don't know the difference? What's the difference between the impact cycle as a book and then taking it to these seven factors of, of success uh, book? Yeah, I've got that humble title, The Definitive Guide to Instructional Coaching. <laughs> um, which I, I should just say, uh, I use that kind of like a, a north point on a compass. I said, I really want to write one book that people can pick up and they get what, what instructional coaching is all about. And and so there's seven factors. One of them is a set of beliefs that draw. The first three are around who you are as a human being, who I am. And I think the first three chapters really apply to anybody who wants to be a productive person. Not that they're the perfect things, but it was really exploring what's it mean what does it mean to have a meaningful life, to have healthy relationships, to interact in ways that are, you know, mutually humanizing? And so first it's the beliefs, what I call the partnership approach, and then communication and leadership. And then the second part is what I do. And so that's the impact cycle and then gathering data and then, um, and then teaching strategies and in particular creating an instructional playbook. And then that all you know, it's education, so it has to be a Venn diagram. So that all takes place inside a third circle, which is where I work, so that there's widespread understanding of what coaching is and isn't, at least in our organization, policies around confidentiality, and then um, that the coach actually has time to do their work and their principal and the coach are aligned theoretically. So, so the definitive guide is trying to lay out sort of almost like a rubric. These are seven things, that, you know, if you don't have a deep understanding of instructional practices, it's going to be difficult when the teacher says, I don't know what to do. And you go, I got nothing either. You know, you really need to be able to <laughs> give them tools. And then if you can't gather data, 
how do you set goals and move forward? Now, the whole thing is going to be driven by the teacher, but they're going to be situations where it's really helpful to have expertise. And then the same thing is there are a lot of people who have expertise, but they come from a place of one up and one down. And so the people don't embrace their ideas. So, so that the, the definitive guide is kind of like that rubric. And then I'm working on books for each of the different elements of the success factors. So there's a book already on the impact cycle. There's a book on better conversations. There's a book on instructional playbooks. There's high impact instruction. And, uh, and now I'm working on one called data rules, which is on data. So, so the idea is this book would give you kind of like, this is the introduction, but then if you really want to go deep, you can go deep and you don't have to go deep with our stuff. You could be looking, for example, a Christian Van Nuremberg's really great book, Essential Coaching Skills provides really valuable information on that. And your work on uh, instruction, uh, I think all three of those books or the new US version, which is the hot, hot item I've been looking at, uh, I think those are those, those instructional practices are, are really powerful. So it doesn't, but I think people need a, a way of understanding this and, you know, to throw a coach out there with no professional development on how to do their job. And so you like have at it is, is uh, risky, if not irresponsible, you know? So it's it's interesting that you've this, this one of the things I think is interesting. So in our, in our, the audience for find the mind the gap is you know we have we have people listening in Australia and I was there recently and and people were talking about about you and uh, you took you spoke to Ollie Lovell and who's a great podcaster and educator out there. So you, you know your your work work is international and and we do, we know we have listeners in you know in the US and so on. So one of the things I think is interesting from for the UK perspective is how. Instructional coaching as a concept has been sort of studied and, and explored, but it's kind of exploded in the last five years. But it still hasn't reached the point that you have in the US where you know, I've, I met people when I was in the US last last term who that's their whole job. You know, they are instructional coach and every day they're in a school coaching teachers and that's their work. And almost nobody in England has that role. They're, they're normally doing it. A sort of as part of their job and so the kind of professional world a community of people doing instructional coaching in the us is it's got this whole sort of professional thing hasn't it so that's interesting why i mean where does that where does that originate how long has that been the case in the us well you know when i first started to think about instructional coaching and describe it a lot of people told me no one will ever do it you know, it's just not going to happen and uh, i remember sitting down with researchers uh, my colleagues at the university of kansas and they said jim you're wasting your time because nobody will ever find the resources for a full-time professional developer but now it's probably you know one of the most popular forms of professional development and, and that's because people recognize you know knowledge that's not actionable isn't particularly helpful and so uh, to have someone who helps you implement the practice and do it. There are lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of examples of people attending workshops and then not being changed by the experience. And so if we really want, we really want the schools our kids deserve, we need to provide professional development that actually leads to meaningful, significant change. And to me, that's to have someone whose job is, you know, they're like the in you know in Buddhism, they have that idea of the bodhisattva, who's somewhere between the world and paradise. Now, not that effective instruction is paradise, but you need someone who really understands what it is to be a teacher, but also is it, their job is to help you figure out how to put that research into the school in a way that's highly respectful of the professionalism of teachers. And I just think there's ample evidence of poorly designed professional development that doesn't lead to much change. So that's that's where I think it goes. I think. Um, I don't know. I think it's just maybe we were on a little earlier in North America and it's grown there quicker. It's growing more in Australia, though. I think in Australia, New Zealand, there's, um, there's greater, still, it's not necessarily a full-time position that much. And in many international schools now that people are becoming full-time instructional coaches, it's kind of growing there. So we'll, we'll see where it goes, but I mean, you want to be as efficient as you can, but, um, if it's not working, it's not very efficient. And instructional coaching should be leading to, you know, significant, unmistakably positive changes that improve the learning and the the well being of kids' lives. You know. Yeah, it's great. Well, I, I, I must admit, it's one of the things I'm looking forward to more than anything uh, in my professional world is is coming to Orlando in October with Oliver to the Teach and Learning Coaching Conference. <laughs> we just can't believe we're going. It's in Sea World. I mean, it's just it's just unreal. <laughs> It's going yeah. to be 
and as the whole the whole place is full of people who are it's totally focused on instructional coaching for three whole days it's just what a great thing wow. so, so emma, emma what, what what's your uh, you know your, your road into this whole world of instructional coaching and gym i'm, I'm kind of going to go from those big conversations you both just had about the kind of global trends and national trends and whatever. i'm going to take it right down to kind of the the local level because in the trust of 15 schools that i currently work in over the last sort of 18 months, what they decided was to invest in instructional coaching and developing instructional coaching as part of what they call teacher development time. So they give everybody in the trust an extra two hours off timetable a week to focus on professional development. And we st- we trained up a load of um, colleagues in instructional coaching and we started to roll it out. And we thought this is brilliant. We're, <laughs> we're, we're really on to something here. But what we found initially was there was a a kind of a grey area between the established idea of coaching and then what instructional coaching was. And so people were mistakenly coming to this, wanted to talk about their general life goals or their partner and how they annoyed them. Or, you know, there was something that wasn't necessarily focused on actually instructional coaching. So. The question I really wanted to ask Jim is, is when you're going to implement this, when you're going from I'm really excited about this, so I want to make this work, how do you communicate to large organisations the very specific approach of instructional coaching and how it's different from or may have crossover with what people may perceive as general coaching? So I uh, have written about this in the impact cycle, and I, mm-hmm. I, I'll come at the answer, try to answer this question in two ways. But um, I distinguish between what I call facilitative coaching and dialogical coaching and directive coaching. And so with facilitative coaching, it's, it's about what I think what you're calling general coaching. And when I'm a facilitative coach, and I don't mean to trivialize it because I really believe in facilitative coaching. I've had many facilitative coaches, but in facilitative coaching, the coach is really helping me think deeply and uh, make plans and focus on important things, set goals. And um, the main job of the coach is to listen really carefully, ask good questions and ask questions that invite me to think deeper and come away with um, action clarity and energy at the end of it. I know what I'm going to do and I feel good about it. But um, that, and that's great when there isn't expertise involved, you know? So if someone was going to help me um, train for a marathon and they were my coach, um, maybe that's not the best example, but if someone is going to help me clean my closet, for example, or organize my desk here, which is pretty messy, um, they wouldn't have to have special expertise. I wouldn't need it. I, I know what I have to do. I have the knowledge I need. But then when you move into other fields, there's a body of literature. There bill- literally billions of dollars has been spent on identifying what effective teaching practices are. And uh, what distinguishes instructional coaching is we share those practices, but we do it from the same set of beliefs that guide facilitative coaching. So dialogical coaching is grounded in helping the teacher hit a goal they want to hit. We think professional development tends to be done backwards. An expert shows up, tells you this is the way you need to teach. And then as a teacher, you have to try to figure out, well, how do I make that fit my class? And then your first implementation is kind of crappy. And the easiest thing to do is to go back to the way it was before. It wasn't that bad before. So why should I do this new thing? But we think it works from the inside out, not from the outside in, which is once you've got a compelling goal the teacher really wants to hit, then you pull out the teaching walkthroughs and you say, I wonder which of these strategies could help us hit that goal. And so it's driven by the goal of the teacher. So an instructional coach works from the same set of beliefs. In fact, large parts of instructional coaching is the same as, say, facilitative coaching, except the fourth part of it, like the beliefs are probably the same. The communication skills are the same. There's probably a different communication process. We use the impact cycle or a framework for conversation, but there's still going to be some kind of framework. Maybe it's Sir John Whitmore's Grow would be the facilitative approach. Um, But when the teacher says to me, you know, my kids are just not engaged at all and I, I don't know what to do. The first question I'd ask is, well, what are you even thinking you might do? But if they're like, I'm, I've got nothing, then I would say, well, is it all right with you if I share some ideas? You tell me, I've got this book with ideas. You tell me if any of these sound like things that might be helpful. And the teacher still makes the choice all through the process. 
the teacher makes the choice. I'm not forcing it, but it's helpful to have somebody who has that expertise and then also understands the process and understands how to set goals and how to make adaptations, the whole process. So that's where instructional coaching is different. Than, and, and I think once you get into the process of the impact cycle, it's pretty clear what we're doing here because we sit down and we say, well, the first thing is we need to get a clear picture of reality of what's happening in your classroom. So I could interview the students. We could have a group conversation. I could video record the class. You could look at it. We could look at student work, some comp or something else, but let's get clear on what's happening. And, th and then we'll set a goal about what you want to see change in the classroom. So I think once you get into the impact cycle, uh, that that's how it goes. Mm -hmm. The directive approach has a place, but I think it's way, way overdone. The directive approach is where I'm going to tell you something you need to do and, and you need to do it. And I think it's it's appropriate for example, if someone's being a toxic force on a team, someone's using microaggressions in the classroom, someone's bullying kids, uh, someone's unprofessional, then you, you take the directive approach, um, especially in an administrative role. Sometimes you have to be directive, but the research is pretty clear. People aren't that motivated by other people telling them what to do. And adults are really skilled in nodding their head yes and doing nothing. And we just, <laughs> fin we, we just found... And it also deprofessionalizes teaching to think that there's one right way and the coach knows what it is and knows what the teacher doesn't know. I think it makes more sense to start with the, the goal that the teacher wants to set and figure out how can we use this set of teaching practices to hit that goal. That's that's how I'd put it. Yeah, that's really interesting. And, I, and this is this is to me, this is the, one of the stuff. I mean, over the over the time, it's great to discuss this and debate these things. And I and I and I am um, I, this is quite a hot debate, I think, in the world of coaching in the, in the UK. Because you've got various approaches and platforms and, and and systems which people are trying to use, and some some people are more more orientated towards saying a bit more positive about about sort of slightly more directive coaching and, and so on. And and it comes out of it from a place like this. So this is my experience, and I wanted to. I'm really interested in what you think about this. So when I when I go to a school, um, with well, you know which has got. Uh, 80 teachers and not not so many full on coaches but you've got sure. people the head of the head of department for maths or science is responsible for those teachers and someone someone might be helping them we we look at the lessons and you know there's, sometimes there's, there's really obvious things that you think you know those would be good strategies to work on as a team like collectively because we can see across all the lessons that they have things in common for example and from our experience, we we know that if those teachers were to just do this instead of that, or be slightly more sharp with this thing, those lessons would be better. So you do have quite a lot of uh, advice to give, but of course the teachers themselves need to come to that. So for me, there's a bit of a tension with sort of the long game of, so what do you think might you need to solve? And sometimes oh. teachers are really good at that, like they really get it. And they can, but sometimes they don't, and the directive thing feels like a, a, a fairly natural thing to do to say, you know, that suggesting thing it comes a bit earlier. So, I mean, do you do you know what I mean? It's sort of, yeah. You say it's quite a long way down the track, but is it is it always? Do you think? Yes. Historically, <laughs> <laughs> okay. yes. Right. Uh, I, I've spent twenty five years studying instructional coaching. I uh, work with Atul Gawande at Harvard. We did a project with surgeons at Harvard. I've written seven or eight books about coaching. We spend more than $30 million on research on instructional coaching. And yet when I go to talk to educators, they say, well, I don't really think it's that way. <laughs> and like, and that's the way it is. We have to experience it ourselves to make it real. And I understand that. I think if I show up and say it has to be done this way, I'm just going to encounter resistance because people are going to do what they're going to do. So, um, I don't think workshops are a bad idea. I give lots of workshops, but they're probably not going to lead to significant change. People start to forget the workshop seconds after it's over. Within three or four days, they've probably forgotten 90% of what they learned in the workshop. But the workshop's important for awareness. If they, if they pick, you know, the beauty of your book and the books on the walkthroughs is I can pick that book up and I can quickly figure out, remind myself of how to do it. I can teach myself how to do it. It's even better if you have a coach who helps you do that. But it's not going to be likely the workshop they remember. It's going to be they have to reteach themselves after the. So what a workshop does is give awareness, gives things out. Now, I do think there's a place for directive, but I think it's when the person's unprofessional. And there are things that 
a district's going to adopt like a world a district wide reading program where there's an expectation that everybody's going to do it. So you can take some elements of coaching, but I think that's more like implementation support than instructional coaching. But to me, if you really want change, it's not going to happen by te treating teachers like empty vessels to be filled. It's going to be hap happen through professional discourse between two equals. And, mm -hmm. um, and I just think the assumption that I know what that person needs to do. You know, one of the cool things about instructional coaching is you model the practices sometimes in the teacher's classroom. And when you stand in front of the class and you start modeling, you go, ooh, this isn't quite as easy as it looked like when I was just sitting on the outside watching what the person had to do. It's a whole different story. The other thing is it takes a while to get proficient at something, whatever it might be. And so when that person has a compelling goal they want to pursue and they really want to hit the goal, they really want to see a change in engagement or achievement, then they'll stick with it and they'll get high quality implementation because the goal matters to them. But if they're just doing it because their administrator needed them to do it, they'll, they'll, do an, they'll, they'll do the bare minimum. They don't want to get fired. They'll do what they have to do, but they don't really embrace it. And to get to proficient, you have to stick with it. And, and if you can have somebody who helps you modify it and adapt it and make it, you know, it's adaptive learning, make it work in your environment, I think the quality is going to be greater. Now, having said all that, <laughs> as forcefully as I've been, I think every situation is different. And so there may well be, such, it, and also cultures are different. So for example, in the little study I did, and I was really superficial to it, but that Atul Gawande did in India, the culture of coaches in India, where they were working with midwives, was a lot different than the culture in you know, New York City. And so I think you have to recognize there's things that work locally and, and so forth. But if, if I'm telling you what to do, and you have to come to me for ideas, I create dependence. And then the person is like, well, you know, I'll give you an example. And then, I'll, <laughs> but I had this a friend of mine uh, invite me out for uh, breakfast a couple of weeks ago, about a month ago now. And um, he's a professor. And he said, my kids, you know, my students just aren't that engaged. He says, I know you, you study this coaching thing. I'd like to talk about how to increase engagement. And then, um, and then I said to him, a coaching question, I said, well, have you ever done something that where the kids were really engaged? And then he talked about this thing he did where kids were all involved and the kids were really engaged. And then I thought, well, you know, I've written high impact instruction. I've got a workshop on how to increase engagement. I'm writing a book now about uh, gathering data on engagement. I've read a lot about engagement. So then I told him seven or eight really great things he could do about coaching, just golden advice. And, uh, and then I just watched him and, and I felt good telling him. You know, I felt, I felt he's going to think I'm really smart because look at all my good ideas I've got to tell him. And he just got smaller in his chair. And at the end of it, I didn't even notice. I was so into telling him all these great ideas. But at the end of it, I think he won't do anything I suggested. And if I had explored the thing that had worked for him mm -hmm. and then figured out how some of my ideas had fit with that, he might have changed. But in that conversation, I just made him feel small. I mean, I diminished him rather than empowered him. So, so I think that's, that's that's the chat. Now, uh, one more thing. I know I said this is my one more thing, but here's one more one more thing. Well, um, I have a project right now with people around the world. Mark Verde in in uh, Bangkok is one of the people, and they send me videos every day about their experiences coaching. And every one of them, the struggle is real. They go in the classroom, they see something happening, and and they want to tell the here's what. Let me fix it for you. But the trouble is, when you fix it for them, you create dependence. You don't want to empower the person. And I, I think there are, maybe there are times when you say, this is what I'm going to do. If it works, great. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to limit what's possible. But in general, and I think DC and Ryan's research would support this. In general, people don't want to be told. People want to process it for themselves. They want to be treated like professionals, not like unskilled laborers. And when we yeah. tell them what to do, we don't treat them like professionals. Do you think, Jim, that there's this is something to do with teachers as in when you're a teacher and you're teaching a student there is a certain urgency about getting through content and getting things done and getting everybody to understand it and you are the giver of the knowledge all the time because you're the expert in the room and you think there's then a kind of quite a difficult potential transition from being that in that kind of high energy expert context to then being in this more uh, well sorry less not less expert, but less in charge of, of leading that environment when you move into a coaching role. 
Absolutely. I think that's a really good point. The question I'd have though, Emma, is I wonder if us being the experts as teachers, and Tom, you'll know better than I do what the answer, both of you will know better than I do what the answer is, but I wonder if if it wouldn't work better if we had more situations where kids are driven to learn something and then they try to, if they, we had inside out learning for kids rather than outside in. So I wonder if we'd better be better teachers if we took the, and I don't have the expertise to answer that question, but I think it's an important question to consider because mm -hmm. I think what I don't like is I don't like people going through the motions. I don't like them just doing something because it has to be done. I want it to be authentic and meaningful. And that starts with something they want to focus on, you know, but I, I think, yeah, as a teacher, my job is to be clear, to help them get it. And I think, um, I think working in a coaching perspective, when you lead a workshop, I think it's effective teaching. And I, I do believe in workshops. I think that they, they, they create awareness. But then if you have a coach who follows up afterwards, I say the coach is the memory for the teachers. The coach can come back and help you implement that thing. And, and in that case, coaching is a different thing than teaching. Mm -hmm. And that's what I mean. It's a quite a different different role and a di potentially difficult transition to go from a really highly effective classroom teacher to a very different way of working as a really effective instructional coach. It's a, it's a different kind of setup, isn't it? Right, right. And it's challenging. And it may not. It's it's an it's a good question whether or not everybody is capable of it. I don't know the answer right. to that question. It's interesting. I mean, and it's, it links to various other analogies that, you know, about teaching about, I mean, Dylan Williams talked about it being like the, the knowledge you need to teach is like the knowledge you need to ride a bike. You have to, you have to get on the bike to feel that and, and someone can guide you. And then last weekend I took my daughter for her first ever practice. She had, she had, she just had her first ever driving lesson. She's 24. <laughs> and and I, I went in the car with her for a practice and it was way too early because she was still at that kind of feeling the clutch and the, the, the gas pedal thing. And, we are doing the boom, boom, boom down the road. And I was trying to say, you know, soft, it's just a little bit softer. And she was sort of saying, well, what do you mean? I said, like, already, I can't tell you what it feels like. Um, I can only tell you how to describe it. So you have to find it, you have to find it. And, and it's so interesting having to sort of, and this is, but this is the thing I, I sort of come to, well, I mean, I wrestle this all the time is that mm -hmm. I, I have a framework for driving, which I can describe quite precisely. And, and because I see so many hundreds of teachers, I have a framework for teaching, which I think is quite, um, you know, well grounded in in evidence of seeing effective teachers teach. So when I'm talking to an individual teacher who might be somebody who, you know, is finding some of the things quite difficult, I, I've, I've got to get them to that same understanding, like my daughter with the driving. I've got to get them to come to that sense of what they might do, and they have to be at the center of it. But I, I have a sense of I, def I definitely have an agenda. It's not like the, it's a blank slate. What do you want to solve? I feel like I'm coming to it with some, some content, some structure because of the, so, I mean, but and that, does that, is that where the sort of playbook idea comes in and, and or, you know, because I feel like we, we can sometimes lose energy by constantly reinventing everything every time we treat to a new teacher. So how, how, what do you think about that? Well, um, I think, uh, the question always comes back to implementation, you know? Mm. Um, I mean, I believe that being really clear on what you're going to teach, gathering data on whether or not kids are learning, providing feedback, adjusting your teaching, um, you know, those things are probably going to be a lot more helpful than, than not. But just because I tell somebody to do it doesn't mean they're going to do it. And, and I think your, your analogy with your daughter is, that person has to work it out for themselves. They have to figure out what works and what doesn't work. Like it's not one, this is a, a phrase I've swiped from Eric Louis, but, or Liu, but uh, it's not one size fits all. It's one size fits one. And what works for one group of students with one teacher, it's going to look different somewhere else. And so to me, uh, to me, the learning has to be to, professional practice. I mean, it has to be learned that way, you know, um, there's a wonderful book about leadership by Ron Heifetz, and he's, he distinguishes between technical challenges and adaptive challenges. And he says, uh, technical challenge is something that has a concrete solution. Like what's the schedule going to look like for next year's school year? Who's going to teach what? That's a technical challenge. And adaptive challenges is, is like raising a child. 
And if one child is complex, what about a classroom full of children? I mean, that's an adaptive challenge. And what Heifetz says is the greatest mistake leaders make is to treat adaptive challenges like technical challenges. Here's a recipe to solve the complex complexity of the classroom. It has to be adapted, and, and which isn't to say, as a coach, I don't think you should sit there like a rock and keep things to yourself. Like if I'm looking at a situation, the teacher says, you know, my kids are, are not listening to me or I feel I can't keep track of it. I think you can propose things, but the teacher's not going to do it just because you tell them. It makes more sense to let, they're going to make a choice whether you give them the choice or not. So I just say, is it all right with you if I share a few ideas I've got about this and you tell me if any of these give you confidence? And, and so I'm, I'm not withholding my expertise. I share my expertise, but I share it in a way that I think recognizes the other person. Because professionalism is about making choices. It's about discretion. If I tell them this is what you need to do, it's probably not going to be nearly as effective as when I say, well, here's a couple options. Tell me which one you think. And if somebody says, I'm thinking I'm going to do this thing, and I think it's just a really wrong-headed thing, I'd say, is it all right if I tell you something? I'm wondering about this. What, what about this? This is something I'm wondering. If you, if you do cooperative learning before you get behavior in place, kids might get more off task. That's what I've said. Well, what do you think? Because they're going to do what they're going to do, whether you tell them or not. So you might as well just put the choice out there in the conversation and let them, let them make the decision. And it's, it's more respectful that way. And it's more likely to lead to change is the way I would put it. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's, that's really interesting. Is there a, sorry, I'm just thinking about the, the <laughs> range of teachers that I work with in terms of career stage. Is there a, is there a sweet spot for instructional coaching to, to work really, really effectively? So I'm just thinking, Colleagues who are initially training to be a teacher very, very early on in their career. Does this instructional coaching, I don't mean does it work, but is it the most effective thing for an, a very early career teacher? Is it something that works better when you've kind of got a few basics alternated in, in terms of your practice? Or is it something that everybody at every stage can get something out of? Or is there like a little sweet spot where this is the point where you kind of, it really kicks in? Um, well, I think there are people for whom coaching may not be the right thing. They have other issues that need to be dealt with more that are more important. I mean, maybe they have a parent they're really worried about, or they have a, a child that's behavior is problematic, or they have issues outside of school, or there's other things that might be going on that aren't coaching things. I think coaching first, first off, it's not the solution to every problem. And then I think, um, I think providing some professional development uh, on different things is helpful. But let's take in America, there's a thing called CHAMPS, which is a classroom management model where you, you identify the expectations for all the activities and the transitions. And then, and, um, and then you teach the kids, what's the conversation going to look like? How do I ask for help? What's the activity? Can I move around? What's particip participation look like? What are the success criteria? And lots of teachers have workshops on champs. And I see those posters they create in their classrooms and they look at them at the start of the year and they never implement them after that. And if they had set a goal around disruptions or engagement or some goal that really mattered to them where they felt this is gonna make a difference in my class, they'd have to keep implementing those practices until they worked. And so the goal would drive it. And I, I don't know that uh, everybody needs a coach, uh, uh, but it would be if I had a mantra, I would say, yes, they do. I mean, I think, and I'm not saying that's the only form. But I think, for example, curriculum development, there's a, a book I wrote called Unmistakable Impact, where I have a thing called intensive learning team. I think that, that happens better in teams. If you're good at statistics and I'm good at geometry and we can get together and plan this together and a group of people come together and share their ideas I think curriculum development makes more sense in team, but when you take the things that have been developed and you put them in the classroom, then the coach becomes really important. So, so that is, of, that's well, something I was well, asking Jim, because this is the debate I've been having recently is about specialism. And there are some people who've been on some, what, well, they were labeled instructional coaching processes, which they felt were unsatisfactory because they didn't have a subject specific component and they felt they were being asked to implement or, the reference frame was generic teaching techniques rather than how to teach history better or maths better. Right, so right. what's your sense of that component of being a key skill or part of what the coach is bringing? 
Well, that's a really good question. I, I, I do think an instructional coach is not a, it's, they're not a content coach. Mm. So uh, their, their job is different. Their job is about pedagogy, but we talk about creating playbooks and the play and the strategies in the playbooks. You could use the walkthroughs as your point of departure for creating a playbook. The, the strategies in the playbook, they're proven by teachers setting goals and hitting the goals using those practices. And then over time, the playbook gets refined. It's a receptacle for organizational learning about what teaching works and what works in one school might not work in another school. And so, so I think, in, in the, I think it's a good critique that, that, you know, different content areas might involve different pedagogical practices, but I think you, over time, the school should be getting more and more clear. These are the things that really work in this school, like our school in Bangkok, who's using your materials mm -hmm. and they've got their seven core strategies they're focusing on. And, you know, I think over time you develop a, a playbook of what works. The, the question is, does it help me? accomplish student focused goals, either achievement or engagement goals. And if it does, it's working. And if it doesn't, then we need to change it. And th that's the impact cycle as we, once we get in there, we, mo we try things out, we make modifications until we hit our goals. So that's kind of how I see it. It's, it's proven, I call it local validity. It's proven in the, in, in the classroom, it's proven in the school. Yeah, that, 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 that's, that's a, that's a good, that's a, I'll come back to that, but go on Emma. No, I was just, I was going to ask, a, I was going to move it on to a chapter in the uh, definitive guide about listening, but I can leave that for a moment if you wanted to pick up on what Jim had just said, though. Uh, no, I, mean, I just, I just think it is my experience. I mean, I feel like I, I quite like the fact that having done this for so long that I could go to any subject. In fact, one of my greatest joys is going into a hair and beauty class in a, a further <laughs> education college. And with now some confidence that when I'm watching them do the, the hair demonstrations and the client interaction stuff, I, I even know some of the language they use, that I can talk to them about, about hairdressing. And in, a, in like, but even though I can't do it myself, because I've seen them do it and I kind of know some of the pitfalls with the, the process and the kind of client facing aspect of it, as well as the technical aspect of it. And so... I'm more confident in the generic coaching because I've sort of got some familiarity with the, the territory. And that, that's true of nearly every other area. So I do feel like it's, if I'd only ever done one session with a, a hairdressing teacher, I think I wouldn't feel so good. But because I've done several, I feel like there's a there's a bit of my knowledge which uh, about the material which supports my wider coaching confidence. That's my experience. But it didn't start that way. You know, what's um, interesting is, Sorry for interrupting, but what's interesting um, is that our coaches in Beaverton, where we were doing the research on Beaverton, Oregon, where we were doing the research on the impact cycle, they felt they were better coaches outside their content area. Really? Now, this was a group of six coaches, so it's not generalizable data, but, and I know if I go to a school, I once went to a school and they said, well, the first thing you're going to do is home economics. They're going to cook, cook something. And you're going to do a model lesson there. And the next one's going to be 3D, three-dimensional drawing. Like, I have no clue. But any of the things they put, I think they're out to get me. But anyway, any rate, um, but, uh, <laughs> but, I, but the coaches said if they, go, if they teach in their content area, they're like, oh, when I taught it, this is what I did. But when they're outside their content mm -hmm. area, they have to listen better. They have to be better coaches. Now, personally, I would rather, my area is English. You know, I studied English literature. I would rather work with an English teacher because I feel we have a shared vocabulary and there's a lot of things we could talk about. And I'm, I feel more confident there. But it was interesting that they felt they coached better outside their area. The bottom line, though, is helping the teacher set a goal and then hitting the goal. And whatever we do, if it's not hitting the goal, we have to change it. It could be what the teacher needs is beyond my expertise. And I'll say, look, I'll get back to you next week. I'm going to do some research. I'll bring back some options. It's 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 not like I have an answer to every every challenge, but what I can do is I can work with the teacher to help them hit the challenge. Yeah, that's interesting. Yes, I love the way you've gone from physics to foils, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me. Quite the spectrum. Um, what I was going to ask, uh, Jim, is is quite a neat segue, actually. It was about the, um, the listening chapter in there and about how important listening is as a coach. So... I was thinking, how much of that can you turn into a process somebody could learn to be a great coach? And is there an element of that listening that's kind of a personal, emotional intelligence element that that maybe can't be taught? So is there, are, 
can the whole listening thing be something that everybody can capture and implement or is there an element of kind of you're just not a great listener you're not going to be a great coach <laughs> i don't know i think that's really a good question i think i think we do people a disservice if we assume they're never going to learn it you know i want to work from i want to have faith that they can learn it uh the skills um it would depend on their motivation too I and mean, there's a whole bunch of things played into it. Like a lot of people struggle not being the expert and being a partner in the learning. I mean, that's something you have to overcome. And uh, interruption is a habit of communication. That's going to interrupt your community, affect your communication. I, I'll just say this. What we found, we work with this group in Beaverton when I wrote the impact cycle. And then we've done other gr groups since then, but I work with them pretty intensively. We met about... 30 days each year for three years and at the end of it we had this kind of uh, wonderful kind of closing act time together and i said you know we've been together we've had all these meetings what's been most useful what's been most helpful to you as a coach and um they said jim no offense but it's not you it's it's <laughs> it's, it's watching ourselves on video they said when we watch ourselves on video then our practices change then we realized we had to to get better at what we did. And so I would say, I don't know for sure if everybody else, if everybody can become a better li listener, but I think if they watch their practice on video, if they see it, they're way more likely to improve their skills. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I, and I want to go into the conversation with the assumption that it's just like teaching. I want to assume every kid can learn the content. I guess it's because the camera never lies, but you can lie to yourself about what you normally do, but you can't lie to the camera if it's actually saying that there. <laughs> well, that's why I think video is so integral for, for coaching, because there's a whole bunch of reasons. The wonderful book about uh, uh, change is motivational interviewing by Miller and Rolnick. And Adam Grant writes about that in his book, Think Again. He has a chapter on motivational interviewing. But but they point out that there are all kinds of ways in which we deceive ourselves about reality. And it's not, it's not a negative thing. It's to protect ourselves. But we have defense mechanisms that minimize the problem or blame others and externalize blame. And then you add to that our perceptual errors like confirmation bias and habituation and all those things. You know, People just don't know what it looks like when they do what they do. And so there's a reason why athletes are always watching themselves on video because they, they can improve their performance. And whether it's coaches or teachers, I mean, I wouldn't force video on people. It's emotionally complex, but I do think it's probably the single most powerful thing you can do to improve your performance is to watch yourself doing it. Oh my God, I, I, it, I did that in my first ever teaching practice in uh, 1986 in Manchester. And I put the, the video was about this size on the tripod at the back of the car. <laughs> when, I, when, I, when I played it back, the first thing I noticed was that there was a, a lad at the back of the class mumbling under his breath swearing rah, 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 i won't say the words he was and i heard that back on the sand <laughs> he knew that would be picked up but it, i was shocked i was i was just wanted to shout at myself stop stop running around i was like <laughs> <laughs> jumping jack it's like a nightmare like a stop still and you know let the material come out of your mouth without it being a show it's like whoa right. so you're right i mean that was more feedback than I needed at that time than, than any of my visiting tutors gave me. And one of the things I want I, I want to pick up on here, because I, well, it's one of the things I, my, you know, in the impact cycle, you know, that identify, learn, improve. It's like this, this whole thing about the reality check. And this to me is such an interesting thing. It's one of the most powerful ideas that I think I've picked up from you is that you need to have a reality check. There's a phrase I find I'm using all the time that, it's so hard to self-report and self-diagnose without some external thing. So video is one. Now the coach, do you feel like as a coach, because you've done some stuff like for training purposes to, I guess, to go and see a lesson, but do you feel like you need to have seen a teacher sort of, you know, several times to build a real good picture of what they're like? Or do you feel that you can be quite effective just with the questions in a, in a, in a, in a one-off session? I, I would say the more time, the better, but often the only time is one time. You know, uh, we, we did a thing where we were looking at uh, when we were first studying coaching in Topeka, Kansas, and uh, back a long time ago, early 2000s, I guess. And um, uh, our, we felt it would, was best to watch three classes because if you see three, then you can tell if one of them's anachronistic. 
you know, so two times the kids were really engaged. One time they weren't engaged. Well, probably they're, it's more like those two times, but it's just often not possible to do that. You know, you, you should be in there. What I would say is um, I don't think it's effective to have the teacher watch video and not share it with you and then have a coaching conversation without knowing what happened in the classroom. I had a few teachers mm. uh, want to do that. And I just found it was kind of like, you know, it was really hard to come know if the goal was a good goal or how helpful it was. So I think ideally, if you, you yourself can video record the class, maybe on some device, share the video with the teacher. If the teacher doesn't mind, you can watch the video. They can watch the video. And then you talk, but that's the ideal scenario. But then if the teacher's like, I don't want, I don't want anybody getting this video and you can say, well, let me film it on your device. You can watch it. You'll at least have been there. But the beauty of video is you can pause, you can go back, you can look it over and you can look at it multiple times and it gives you more information. I, I think the, you know, the more data, the better, but there are those who say like five minutes of video is powerful enough. To me, I think you need, you need the whole class at least as a, as a way to go. I really, that's interesting. Have you ever done that, Emma? What, videoed myself? Yeah. Yeah, first three minutes of watching it, I was like, my God, it's my mother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, it's hard. You, ha you, have to get through the, you have to get through the physical thing. Like one of our coaches uh, said, I'm never wearing those purple pants again. That was her first reaction, you know? And, and, I, and I think, you know, nobody ever looks at their video and goes, I'm skinnier and younger than I thought. You know, it's, it's always... It's always a it's a shock. Although, of course, with Zoom and all that, we're getting to a point where it's much more common to see ourselves. Mm. But, but still, there is there is this sense of. But after you've watched once or twice, then you get to whether well, there's that person who is me, and mm. it's different. But it is. It's it really is useful, and especially if you can video video yourself from different vantage points in the room at the same time, so you can really see the expression on the children's faces as you're talking. Because we we set it up where. We've got one camera trained on the teacher and one camera trained oh, on the great. children to actually see. So you could in the children's one, you could hear what the teacher was saying, but you could actually see the responses of the children, which was really, really interesting. Because you think when you're teaching, you're seeing exactly what their what their responses are. You're not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not at all. And when you watch it back, you're like, oh, that fell a bit flat or that really worked or that was really useful. So. Yeah, I have done it. And it, it is really interesting, but it's it's a big hurdle to get over. It's kind of like you just have to get past it and, and get on with it. And the other thing is one of the best ways to roll it out in the school is to do it yourself first. So kind of put yourself mm -hmm. up there as the video sacrificial lamb and, and put yourself <laughs> out there first. <laughs> Do you think it matters, Jim? And if you research the sort of the behavior, like the coaching like dynamics, because I mean, I, got, I just realised I could talk to you forever on this. But I, so I, I feel like I've, I've formed a habit, and I don't know if it's a good one, but it's just see, I just feel it, it. I feel it's productive, so I keep doing it. Which is, I sort of go into the back of a class and I sit next to someone who has a space next to them, and often is not there a student who's sort of hanging on the edge of the lesson, just about hanging in there, and I'm not really looking at the teacher so much as being with the student to see what they're thinking and doing whilst the lesson's happening. And to me, that kind of reality check is, like if I watch the teacher over there, they might be doing all kinds of good stuff. But what for this student's experience is my kind of weather vein of, are they are they making progress? And often the teacher's so far away from them, they don't, they don't pick up on that particular student. And that's my, I find that to be a really productive form of reality check. Like, did you notice the such and such? So, I mean, what do, you, what do you typically do when you go in? Do you sit at the back? Do you, you know, walk around? Well, first off, you probably know, given your experience as a head teacher, you you know more about this than I do. So I would defer to your your expertise on that. But when I go in, um, I'm not really trying to come to a conclusion about the class. I'm just trying to take it all in. And so... You know, there's in, in I think it's in the impact cycle. We have a list of things you can talk about with the teacher. Where would you like me to sit? Is it okay if I talk to students? We work those things out. But usually, I end up just sitting down, video recording the teacher when she talks or he talks, and then video recording the students when they talk. And even that, I would discuss with the teacher because I I'm not going in there to to get my opinion. I'm going in there to get as much information as I can. So when I sit down with the teacher, they can set a goal. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love John Campbell's quote, which he, he tells me he got from Tony Grant, but his quote is, um, 
a less than perfect goal chosen by the teacher is better than the perfect goal chosen by the coach. Mm. And so what I'm trying to set up is an, um, an emotionally compelling goal that the teacher really wants to go after. Now, if they're doing something that I think is, you know, misguided or unproductive, I'm not going to tell them that's wrong, but I'm also not going to be silent. I'm going to share in a way that honors their capacity to treat them like a professional, which is to say, here's what I'm wondering. You tell me what you think. And the two of us back and forth, share the ideas and explore it together. So I think talking to kids about what's happening was, uh, I, you know, I, uh, uh, my colleague, Don Deschler at the university of Kansas, they had a project. Our work has primarily been with students with learning disabilities at KU, but they had a study where they just followed students all day and they just went to every class. They just sort of followed the student all day. And that was super powerful just to see what's happening. But kids in particular with learning disabilities or behavior disability, one student, only one student talked to him all day. And that was because they bumped into him and, well, yeah. and they said, oh, sorry. And that was it whole day, no interactions with anybody the whole day. So I think that's real powerful. And I think it would be the same thing in the classroom. You could probably see a lot just by looking at one student. Yeah, I mean, I often do that. And I feel like, anyway, it's so interesting. And we're, gosh, we're, we're getting the, the nod from our producer. So we have to wrap this. <laughs> so I, we, I, 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 honestly, we say this, you know, to, to people because these conversations are so rich. But I really, I just want to have like part two instantly. Well, we're so going to do it. We're going to do it in a couple of weeks. So you're going to be on our yeah, podcast. So we podcast. will have part two. I'm so excited about that. And Oliver will be with me then. But right. I, I actually decided to do this before. I don't often prepare stuff, but um, I want I want to read out a bit from your book because I wrote this in the forward and I think this is wonderful. So in your conclusion to, to in your um, definitive guide, it says, most important, perhaps, coaches partner with teachers so they can have an unmistakably positive impact on children's lives. And when a coach helps a teacher make one positive change, that change can have an impact on every student that teacher ever teaches. And I just wanted to go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> that's the kind of punch the air kind of statement. But it's so it's so powerful. Like, mm -hmm. if you make a positive change for a teacher as a coach, every te kid they ever teach is going to be impacted by that. And that's right. like, that's a brilliant, that's a wonderful thought. And one of the things I love about your work, Jim, and I'm going to wrap up with this, is that you motivate coaches to be better coaches as well as teachers to be better teachers. And I feel that's a really important thing because – it's not easy to do. And you have a kind of humility that you model so beautifully every time you talk about coaching. And it, it, I feel like I'm sort of having to, I'm just thinking so hard about everything I do because of the way you model it, have, you have that kind of depth of uh, kind of belief about what the principles, and I think that's so important. I get a bit sidetracked by pragmatism and mm -hmm. getting things done. And you're like, there are principles and they matter and you keep that kind of line and i think that's really important that we have that you have that kind of strength of voice in, in the whole sort of community so look thank you so much jim really great talking to you um thank you to everyone listening to mind the gap making education work across the globe we've had an absolute storm of of uh great guests <laughs> this this uh, term since christmas and wow just talking to jim has been a real honor so thank you so much thank you emma thank you thanks jim and thanks for everyone listening